1933. The place, the Soviet Union. Behind the facade, food is being used as a weapon against peoples who have proven troublesome to Moscow. Famine is engineered deliberately in the North Caucasus, the Volga Basin, and Ukraine. The Soviet secret police seal off Ukraine's borders. No one can get out or bring food in. A nation the size of France is strangled by hunger. In less than two years, 10 million people die. Seven million of them in Ukraine. Three million of them children. terrible thing I've ever seen. It precisely because of the deliberation with which it was done and the total absence of even any kind of sympathy. If you revive this terrible past and uh, you are always shaking again and it moves you again and you, you can't get rid of these terrible pictures you have seen or these terrible reports you have gotten in this period nearest city was 40 miles, so I walked about once a week or so to that city. I could buy for my salary two loaves of bread a month. So that's only how we could survive. But the peasants were dying. This was the first time in my life that I saw people dying. And uh, of course it was very hard. Untold story of Ukraine's darkest tragedy begins at a time of great optimism and joy in March 1917. A tidal wave of revolution sweeps aside the mighty Tsarist Empire. National boundaries change rapidly with the dramatic shifting of power. Ukrainians grasp the chance to reclaim their independence after 200 years of Russian domination. Kiev, Ukraine's ancient capital, is once again the seat of government. Ukraine's rich and fertile land has supplied Europe with grain for countless generations. Even the ancient Greeks depended on her abundant stores of wheat. History has taught Ukraine that freedom has a price. The people prepare to defend their national republic against all invaders. December 1917. Having consolidated Bolshevik control in Russia, Lenin prepares to reclaim the former Tsarist territories. In four 
ensuing years of chaos, Ukrainians fight Lenin's Red Army, Denikin's White Army, Germans, Poles. Whether the armies march in as enemies or allies, the price is always measured in tons of food. This bountiful country is slowly bled dry. 1921, the dust of battle finally settles. Russia has retaken the major part of the country. Western Ukraine is carved up between Poland, Romania, and Czechoslovakia. The Soviet conquerors ship out more and more grain to feed Moscow. A drought adds to Ukraine's misery. Millions die as the breadbasket of Europe experiences its first famine. Yet this is but a preview of the tragedy to follow. To end the continued resistance to Bolshevik rule, Lenin adopts a new economic policy. Grain requisitions are canceled. The peasant farmer is allowed to trade freely on the open market. The impact on Ukraine is dynamic. 80% of her population are farmers. Hoping to win further support, Lenin tolerates the national revival which has been gathering momentum since the 1917 revolution in Kiev. Ukraine's blossoming renaissance is so powerful, Lenin's successor, Stalin, views the loss of Russian influence with increasing alarm. Ivan Maestrenko was a Marxist instructor of journalism in Soviet Ukraine. A meeting of the Politburo heard a report that students in Kiev no longer know how to speak Russian. Everyone was shocked. How can that be, they asked. Well, in Ukrainian schools during the 20s, the Russian language was treated like French, German, etc., as a foreign language. And that's why students who came from Ukrainian schools didn't know Russian. And not knowing Russian constituted a clear threat that Kiev would become the capital of an independent Ukraine. Thousands of Ukrainian language parishes spring up across the country. For the first time since the 17th century, the Ukrainian Orthodox Church re-establishes its independence from the Moscow Patriarchate. the flourishing avant-garde models itself on Western, not Russian, culture. <laughs> Literary circles abound. Writers and poets develop a uniquely Ukrainian literature. Ukraine's leading communist writer, Mykola Khmylyove, elaborates on the dangerous slogan, Away from Moscow. Even the leader of the Ukrainian Communist Party, Nikola Skripnik, sees the USSR as a kind of League of Nations and argues for greater cultural and political autonomy to win Ukrainians over to communism. Nikola Skripnik really saw himself as um, an equal to Stalin, as an independent national ruler. I mean, when he went to Moscow, he'd take a translator, even though he spoke perfect Russian. Um, he tried with some success to establish a cultural protectorate over Ukrainian communities in Russia. He even called for um, uh, the direct annexation of border areas with the majority of Ukrainians um, to Soviet Ukraine. So he was actually making territorial demands against Stalin. By 1928, Stalin is a law unto himself. This efficient, ruthless administrator has eliminated all effective opposition within the Politburo. The dream of a worldwide communist revolution has not materialized. As Stalin strengthens communism within the borders of the USSR, Russian nationalism is increasingly injected into his policies. The strong cultural individuality of Ukraine is no longer tolerated. 1929. Stalin strikes at the nation's heart and mind, its church and intelligentsia. 
Over the next few years, the systematic liquidation of intellectuals is carried out by the communist regime in Ukraine. 5,000 scholars, scientists, poets, and artists prominent during Ukraine's independence are arrested for allegedly belonging to the SVU, a secret organization the Soviets claim is planning an armed insurrection. Only 45 get a public trial. No evidence is considered necessary. Thousands upon thousands are imprisoned, deported, and executed later as mass arrests continue throughout the 30s. Even the church is accused of involvement in this alleged plot. Many priests were arrested. Many were sent to Siberian concentration camps. Many shot. My father was one of them. He never came back. I know this from personal experience. 30 bishops were murdered. Thousands of priests were perished. Hundred thousands of faithful were liquidated. Metropolitan Vasily Pkivsky and his two successors were arrested too. To this day, we don't know what happened to them. The church was full of people. Some communists rode inside on horseback and ordered me to undress. It was March. There was snow outside. The snow was melting, and I walked in water up to my knees while they rode on horseback. They interrogated me, but I didn't answer their questions. And for this, I was rewarded with pistol blows across my back. They began taking down the icons and smashing them on the ground. The people wanted to go inside the church, but they didn't let them. They ruined everything, smashed everything in the church. And the people stood outside crying because they couldn't do anything. When a man went up to remove the bell, and that bell fell to the ground and rang out, all the people burst into tears. Everyone was weeping and saying goodbye to the bell because that was the last time that bell rang. By 1930, only the Russian Orthodox Church remains. In October 1928, Stalin introduces a drastic five-year plan to transform the Soviet Union from a backward rural society into a modern, self-sufficient industrial empire, virtually overnight. Military defense takes priority. Socialism must be protected from all future enemies. Western technology is urgently needed. To pay for it, Stalin must seize the only exportable resource, grain. And so he decrees the compulsory collectivization of agriculture. Henceforth, all private lands, livestock, and farming implements will belong to the state. The farmer will work as a laborer for pay, like a worker in a factory. One of the intriguing elements in the Ukraine was that it brought together both the peasant question and the nationality question in a way that was somewhat different than in other areas. Because in the Ukraine, Ukrainians tended to concentrate in rural areas, and in the city areas, particularly in the eastern Ukraine, it was Russian and Jewish populations that dominated. So that any policies that the Bolsheviks adopted toward the peasants had an obvious impact on Ukrainians very directly. With the destruction of the intellectuals and the church well underway, collectivization allows Stalin to break the farmers, the backbone of the nation. Anticipating fierce resistance, he orders the liquidation of the kulaks as a class. Kulak is a Bolshevik label for the wealthier farmers who own 24 acres of land or hire labor. They are considered the potential leaders in any revolt. The state confiscates not only the lands of the farmers, classified as kulaks, but also all their possessions. It is forbidden by law to assist these enemies of the people. 
Miroslava Vutka was seven when her father was exiled. She never saw him again. In the winter of 1931, they came to evict us from our house. Activists, a group of people, if they could be called people, came into the house and looked over everything and made us very frightened. Then they said, get out, this isn't your house anymore. But mother wouldn't leave. At least let us spend the rest of the winter here, she begged. Where can I go with these children and old people? The men picked her up and threw her outside. A militiaman or activist stood in the doorway as a guard. Mother shouted to us, children don't leave the house. There were tears and screams. It was frightening. We grabbed hold of the benches in the house, screaming and refusing to let go. Then the men began to take us out one by one. They would throw one of us outside and then another. Thus, they threw us out of the house one by one, all six of us. A courageous neighbor risked deportation to give her family shelter. Some farmers burn their crops, kill their livestock, and flee to the cities. But over the next three years, one million men, women, and children are rounded up, jammed into sealed boxcars, and shipped off to the remotest corners of the Soviet Union. Survivors work as slave labor, producing raw materials for export to the West. This is the end of the line for many of the best farmers and cultural and religious leaders of Ukraine. Party activists are brought in from the cities to push through collectivization. Anyone who opposes the measures is denounced as a kulak and deported. Yet resistance comes from all quarters. Not so long ago, the Bolsheviks had given land to the poor. Now they want to take it away. Thank God I didn't kill anyone. I didn't have anyone put away. I didn't inform on anyone. But I wrote. I was an agitator. I attended meetings and also told the peasants, bring in the grain, hand over the grain. The workers have nothing to eat. There's a world crisis. Hitler has taken over in Germany. The Japanese are advancing into Manchuria. Our country is a fortress that's surrounded by enemies on all sides. And I yelled and begged and swore and threatened, of course. Anyone who doesn't bring in grain had better watch out for the punishing sword of the proletarian dictatorship. Well, I rattled on as we all did and believed that it was necessary. My father was very much against collectivization. He said they were ruining the village, that the Bolsheviks knew nothing about farm management, that even the old landlords were better managers than the Soviet district officials. But when you're 18 or 20 years old, who believes his father? In 1930, Petro Grigorenko was one of the many students brought in from the cities to harvest the grain. There was rebellion, then sabotage. People did not give up. They attacked the local authorities, usually not killing anyone. They only tied them up and threw them into a barn or simply drove them from the village. And they took back their property, took back their horses, cows and implements which had just been taken by the collective. They would take all that back. 
To crush the rebellions, troops were sent in. They would shoot over the people's heads, but they would also shoot at their heads and their hearts. Vasily Sokil witnessed a squad of GPU secret police attacking a lone defiant farmer. They formed a wide circle around the house. When they realized that the farmer inside had no more bullets left, they threw a grenade into the attic. After that, everything fell silent. The fact of that armed resistance burned itself into my memory. I saw that even under those terrible conditions, there were people who believed in fighting for the right to live as the Ukrainian farmer had always lived. The wheat is left standing in the fields. The demoralized farmers respond to the ruinous taxes and the presence of troops by simply refusing to work. The grain quotas or taxes are deliberately raised to exceed what the individual farmers can possibly produce. Either they join the collectives where the taxes are three times lower or face exile as kulaks. By mid-1932, three-quarters of all Ukrainian farms are collectivized. Then, in August, crippling new quotas are levied on the collectives themselves. Another exorbitant quota is levied in October, and yet another at the beginning of the new year. These levies are impossible to meet. The working people were getting rationing card, and they could get the food from the warehouse in the village like one liter of milk and two pounds of bread for a week. But the farmers, the peasants, they could not get anything any place. And so they start, they had nothing to eat right away the second day after those uh, people from government took everything from them. The regime blames the farmers for the stringent food rationing in the cities. In reality, the Soviets are dumping tons of wheat on Western markets. The 1932 harvest yields enough grain to have fed the entire population of Ukraine for two years. Instead, famine ravages the country. It was a spoken order. Stalin gave it. That there was a definite plan, I knew from the instructions given us by Stanislav Kosyar, the secretary of the Communist Party of Ukraine. He said, the Kulak wants to crush our Soviet government with the bony hand of famine. We will bend this bony hand back on the throat of the Kulak. The Russians came from house to house and took all the foods that people had in the house, starting with grain, flour, wheat, or, or what, barley, or whatever they had, up to the last drop of the food. They took the beets, the beans, potatoes, whatever they had in cellars or in the house. And uh, besides that, they didn't trust them. They started searching the houses looking all over, digging in the house and holes in the floors, digging in the ovens, ruining their ovens. And so they went from house to house and took everything from peasants. Nineteen thirty one. The farmers crowd into the cities, selling heirlooms, anything, in order to buy the bread they themselves have produced. An internal passport system is introduced to deliberately confine them to their villages. 1932, Stalin condemns the Ukrainian party's urgent appeals to reduce quotas and send aid. He accuses them of placing local interests above the success of the five-year plan. The war for bread is the war for socialism, he says. 
Stalin's trusted envoy, Pavel Postyshev, is given sweeping dictatorial powers and sent into Ukraine with an army of secret police to purge the Ukrainian party ranks and to squeeze out the last kernels of grain. 112,000 trusted party members from Russia are now stationed in Ukraine. They guard the standing crops and livestock from the starving brutally enforcing the law to protect state property. This was a horrible law. If they saw a child picking a stalk of wheat, trying to eat those unripe grains, that was a very serious crime. This was a government order to punish anyone, even to death by execution. Not only do all state quotas have to be met, but additional grain has to be set aside for seed and livestock before the collective farm workers get paid. 80% of the collectives fail to pay their workers anything at all. And a new draconian measure prevents the workers from searching for work elsewhere. The collective farm where my father worked had stood since 1928. It was a good, strong farm. But although this was the best farm around, it was suffering even more than the others because they were disciplined and had everything organized on time. While well, government trucks would pull right up to the winnowing machines and take everything, they even took the chaff. My father was already swollen. Not too much, but his feet were swollen and his eyes, all in the typical look of starvation. And in the house, there was nothing left but half a pumpkin, and that's all. I went to the collective farm to get horses. There, a friend of mine from the Communist Youth League said weakly, you came to take your father away? I'll take him. Maybe he'll survive. But it's too late for us. Village mothers, dying of hunger, throw their children onto trains heading into the cities in the desperate hope someone will take pity and feed them. I entered the car, railroad car, and then I saw it was full of children. Some of them were enormously thin, but others were thin at the top of the body, but their legs were uh, enor and stomachs were enormously swollen. Some of them had uh, convulsions. In general, if a child was lying very quietly, we already knew this child will die soon. During the day, people would hide. You couldn't see them anywhere. But at night, they would come out like shadows, lining up in front of the bread stores, hoping maybe to get some bread in the morning. Only homeless children could be seen walking in the streets. Homeless children and starving women in rags and dead bodies, children stepping over them. That's how the city of Kharkiv looked then. It is hard to imagine how long those lines were for the so-called commercial bread. They lined up by the thousand, or two, or three, and even as many as seven thousand. Andor Henke was the German consul stationed in Kiev. 
he and his family witnessed the horrors of the famine firsthand. I ran out of the consulate because the Russian newspapers were reporting that there was a famine in Germany, but that everything was wonderful in Russia. I became very angry and took pictures of the corpses. I still have a very vivid memory of that time in Kiev. We were children at the time. My sister was four years younger than I. We lived in the consulate, like in a golden cage. We weren't allowed to go out in the streets alone during this time. Nevertheless, I remember the misery and the famine very well. I remember seeing bodies everywhere, in doorways, on street corners. Wagons would take them away. They were picked up, thrown in, and driven away. Some of them were still alive, but they were all thrown on a pile and taken out of the city and thrown into a pit and covered with earth. The children, teenagers, girls, boys, went along stumbling and falling and begging for bread. I couldn't take it. I went home and I screamed and cried hysterically. We survived thanks to parishioners, the railroad employees, who had the chance to travel beyond the borders of Ukraine. And we had neighbors, Soviet officials. They always had uh, food. We came through their garbage can cans. We eat rotten potatoes, rotten cabbage and beets, and the scraps of food which they threw away. I am not ashamed to admit it, because it was a matter of survival. I didn't want to die. When we reached the state farm and met the manager, he hired us to work there. He told us we would work at night, feeding the horses linseed cakes mixed with chopped straw. He said we should do this when people are asleep, because if they were awake, they would eat the horses' fodder. We said, how can we do that? People are more important than horses. But he said, we need the horses to cart the corpses away. They collected the corpses from the houses. A deep sleigh would stop at every house, and the men would ask, do you have any? Thank God, we have none. Then they'd stop at the next house. Have you got any? Yes. Well, bring them out. But I don't have the strength. Then two or three young men, themselves with swollen legs, would go into the house, bring out the corpse, and place it in the sleigh. They'd collect two, three, four a day. In the spring, when my little sister died, her body lay in the house a whole week. We kept it until Mother came back from the state farm. People would come to our house and knock on the door every day, asking whether we had any corpses. We'd shout, no, we don't. Then the wagon would continue down the street collecting corpses. When Mother came home, we had to bury my sister. How could we bury her? There was nothing for a coffin. We wrapped her in a sheet, placed her on a sled and took her to the cemetery. We put her between two coffins in a big grave. Coffins were placed on top also. And that's how we buried her.
Half a world away, kinsmen of the famine victims voice protests and form relief committees. Help is offered from Canada, the United States, Switzerland, France, Belgium. Cardinal Initzer initiates relief in Austria. Metropolitan Sheptitsky in western Ukraine. But all shipments of food grind to a halt at the Soviet border. The Soviet Red Cross flatly denies the existence of famine. The hands of the international organization are tied. Metropolitan Mstislav was then a deputy in the Polish parliament. He helped to organize relief efforts by Ukrainians living under Polish rule. Our attempts to ship the grain into Ukraine were coordinated through the Soviet embassy in Warsaw. They told us this was not in their jurisdiction and that they would relay the request to the central government in Moscow. But Moscow's communications to us were, what are you doing? Why would we need grain? We have had a wonderful harvest. There is no famine of any kind. This is nothing but anti-Soviet propaganda, that's all. So they gave us no hope of any kind that the grain would ever get there. Spring 1933, the man-made famine reaches its height. 25,000 are dying every day, 1,000 an hour, 17 human beings every minute. They tried to fool the people, telling them the famine was from natural causes. But the people saw that the famine was not from natural causes. No matter how hard they tried to hide the grain sealed inside mills and silos, people somehow found out there was plenty of grain, but they wouldn't give out any. Most of the grain was inside state mills. They were filled and nobody was allowed near them. Some of it was piled high in the yard in sacks, covered with canvas, and it just rotted away. When I came to Mehedjuka that first time, all the bushes were still green, but when I came back, there was not a single leaf left. They ate it all. You couldn't hear a dog bark in the village, because they were eaten also. We were told, children, it's very dangerous to go begging for food from house to house now. Terrible crimes are happening. You may not have heard, but a man who was going to the well for water or was coming back from the well fell and froze to death. His wife cut off pieces of his flesh and ate them. My cousin, who was much younger than I, had three children and those three children were eaten by their neighbors. A directive issued by the Justice Department ensures that no official records of cannibalism are kept. All such cases are withdrawn from the courts and dealt with behind the closed doors of the OGPU secret police. Having killed a quarter of the nation's population, the Soviets staged one of the greatest cover-ups in history. At a grain conference in London, the Soviets campaigned vigorously to raise their grain export quotas from 25 to 85 million bushels of wheat. The scheme is effective. Few can imagine a state exporting grain at the cost of its own people's lives. Indignant over the mass unemployment and hardships in their own countries, many influential socialist sympathizers unwittingly rally to Moscow's defense. 
George Bernard Shaw and a party of leading British socialites visit the USSR and report, quite truthfully, that the restaurants where they eat are full of food. Another important foreign guest to receive the red carpet treatment is former French Prime Minister Edouard Herriot. He is actually given a five-day guided tour of Ukraine at the height of the famine. His favorable impressions of the country receive widespread publicity. I would like to thank the government and the people of the Soviet Union for their warm reception. Johann von Herwart was a young attaché at the German embassy in Moscow and after the Second World War, German ambassador to Great Britain. He recalls how the Soviets stage managed Erio's entire trip. The famous visit of uh, the uh, president of the French uh, cabinet, Erio, when he came to Kiev, then he had the impression that everything was all right in Kiev. The streets were well cleaned, through which he, he drove. He got a wonderful breakfast uh, in his hotel. And then uh, in, in the streets, there were trucks uh, labeled bread, and bread was unloaded, and uh, everything seemed to be fine. And then he went to see a uh, collective farm, and when he spoke to the uh, farmers, nobody knows if they were really farmers or put there just for the inspection of, of Ario. They told him that everything was fine, much better than under the Tsars. And he came home and said, there's no famine in Ukraine. The peasants are very happy. Idealized scenes of work and happy peasant life are the staple diet in Soviet movie theaters as the famine rages on. A sensational show trial is staged in Moscow to further help distract the Soviet people from the failures of the five-year plan. Six British engineers working in the USSR face the death sentence on trumped-up charges of sabotage, espionage, and bribery. The interest the trial arouses in the West gives the Soviets extra leverage to muzzle the foreign press corps. Correspondents are bluntly told that if they want access to the trial, they are not to mention the famine in their dispatches. Having served their purpose, the British saboteurs are eventually released. Malcolm Muggeridge arrived in the USSR in 1932. He was one of the very few journalists to defy the Soviet travel ban and report on the real conditions in the countryside. I don't think that foreigners realize sufficiently how completely the Soviet authorities can control the foreign press. The sense it worked simply that if you wrote a message, you had to take it along to the press department. I mean, the, the telegraph company wouldn't accept it unless it was stamped by them. You had to submit it to them. And they would read it through, and they would uh, say, you, you can't say that. As I began to be very critical of the whole um, setup, to criticize the use of terrorism by the government, the articles that I wrote on the famine would undoubtedly, I would have had to leave. But I sent those over in a diplomatic bag. They would never have got out of the country otherwise. And um, I left before they had appeared. For every article on the famine that appeared, Two were published denying its existence. Muggeridge recalls the most influential correspondent in Moscow was Walter Duranty, the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for the New York Times. He was not only the greatest liar among the journalists in, in Moscow, but he was the greatest liar of any journalist that I've ever met in the 50 years of journalism. And we used to wonder whether, in fact, the authorities hadn't got some kind of hold over him because he so utterly played their game. But it didn't uh, worry the New York Times who featured his uh, reports. When it came to the famine, the great famine in the Ukraine brought about by collectivization, that was when his reporting was particularly disgraceful because he denied that there was any famine. 
the Soviets actually grant Duranty permission to tour Ukraine unchaperoned. He reports in the Times that all talk of famine now is ridiculous. Yet documents from the British Foreign Office reveal that in private conversations at the British Embassy, Duranty said as many as 10 million people had died. When they were discussing the question of um, recognizing the Soviet Union, the United States government recognizing the Soviet Union, the articles of Duranty were considered as very valuable evidence on the side of, of recognition. Shortly after Soviet Foreign Minister Maxim Litvinov visits Washington in November 1933, the U.S. recognizes the Soviet government and enters agreements securing a balance of trade in favor of the United States. The following year, the Soviet cover-up achieves its ultimate success, a seat in the League of Nations. And this in spite of the fact Western governments knew all about the famine. The government of Weimar, the democratic government, was well aware of what was going on in the Soviet Union. But the attitude of the government uh, was, I would say, you could call it passive. And with the younger ones of the embassy, we always were of the opinion then at that period that we ought not to have any commercial relations with a criminal government which allowed hundreds of thousands and even millions of people to starve. The government said we had already great unemployment in Germany and if we stopped delivering the manufacturers goods to the Soviet Union, would increase unemployment in Germany. That was the situation. Trade relations take precedence. The famine is regarded as a strictly internal Soviet affair. The Western governments make their peace with genocide. The communist writer Mikola Kriyove reacts to the destruction of his people by starvation, the mass arrests of his friends and party members by taking his life. The party strongman Nikola Skripnik is denounced as an enemy of the state. He, too, commits suicide. So we, these suicides came to symbolically represent the end of an epoch in the history of Ukraine. Up to that time, we believed that a normal national development was possible. As they taught us, a culture socialist in content and national in form. Stalin ends the famine with a single decree. Having broken the Ukrainian farmers, he can afford to give out grain on the collectives during the harvest in 1933. 1934, purges take place in the cities and mark the end of Ukrainian participation in the running of their country. 27,000 Ukrainian communists are arrested and replaced by Russians. Only 36 out of 259 Ukrainian writers survive as the terror intensifies. The jail cells are rapidly emptied as Ukrainian nationalism becomes an offense punishable by death. The purges stop when the Nazis invade Ukraine in June 1941. Millions perish as Hitler attempts to replace Stalin's shackles with his own. To divert attention away from their own brutalities, the Nazis invite an international commission to inspect the mass graves left from Soviet rule. In the town of Vinnytsia alone, the commission uncovers the bodies of over 9,000 brutally murdered farmers, workers, poets, priests. No one can estimate the full total of those who disappeared in Stalin's reign of terror. was that she never adapted to wearing chains.
the Soviet Union denies to this day the famine ever took place. But the harvest of despair cannot ever be forgotten. Dave, I'd like you to meet Vardin Martinenko. Sorry, what was the name? Vardin Martinenko. What sort of name is that? It's Ukrainian. It's Russian, isn't it? No, it's Ukrainian. Ukrainian? What's that? Where is that? And what is Ukraine? Ukraine is located in southeastern Europe, directly north of the Black Sea. This is one of the 15 constituent Soviet republics of the USSR. Ukraine is situated in an important position between the Russian SFSR, itself a federation, and the various satellite countries of Eastern Europe. It occupies an area of 234,000 square miles, which makes it larger than any European country, excluding Russia. Many people often confuse Russia with the USSR, otherwise known as the Soviet Union. In fact, the Russians account for just over half the total population of the Soviet Union. That means that today there are at least 120 million non-Russians with their own languages, culture and historical traditions living in the Soviet Union. The largest 14 non-Russian nations are formally welded to the Russians in a federal arrangement, the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, though in practice this federation is run as a Russian-dominated unitary state. The Ukrainians are by far the largest non-Russian nation in the USSR. The population of Ukraine in 1973 was just over 48 million, of whom about 75% were Ukrainians. More than 6 million Ukrainians live in the USSR beyond the borders of the Ukrainian Soviet Republic. Ukraine is extremely rich in natural resources. It has a favorable climate and a very fertile soil. Ukraine was once known as the granary of Europe. The country also has vast energy and mineral resources. 
In 1970, Ukraine produced one third of the total Soviet coal output, just under a third of the natural gas, 40% of the steel, and 57% of the Soviet Union's iron ore. Situated on the banks of the Dnieper River is the ancient Ukrainian city of Kiev. It is the capital of what today is a highly industrialized and technologically advanced country. If nature has endowed their country with abundant natural wealth, history has certainly not been as kind to the Ukrainians. Located in an area which for centuries was regarded as the border between Europe and Asia, this land has attracted all manner of invaders, conquerors and empire builders. Mongols, Poles, Turks, Austrians, Germans and Russians. The history of the Ukrainians has been an almost continuous story of resistance against foreign domination, a struggle for national survival, often in seemingly hopeless conditions. Their alien rulers, on occasions, would simply deny their existence as a distinct nation, or contemptuously refer to them as little Russians or little Poles. Although one of Europe's forgotten peoples in more recent times, the Ukrainians' history may be traced continuously from the medieval state of Kiev and Rus. In 10 years' time, in 1988, Ukrainians all over the world will be celebrating a thousand years of Christianity, which was introduced into Kiev by Volodymyr the Great. In the 17th century, at the same time as Oliver Cromwell was fighting for parliamentary rights and privileges, the Ukrainian Cossacks had defeated the Polish monarchy and were consolidating their state according to republican and democratic principles. At the turn of this century, the territory populated by Ukrainians had been divided for over a hundred years, the western part having gone to Austria-Hungary. The larger Russian-ruled part had suffered the harsh policies of Tsarist autocracy, including prohibition of the Ukrainian language. But in both parts, repression had encouraged the process of national regeneration, which was spurred on by the fiery words of the great national poet, Taras Shevchenko. In 1917, when Tsarist autocracy disintegrated, the Ukrainians ambitiously seized the opportunity to solve, at one stroke, the two long-standing inseparable problems of national oppression and social and economic exploitation. In March, a government was formed in Kyiv, the Ukrainian Central Rada, and on January the 22nd, 1918, independence was declared. But the granary of Europe was in great demand, and by the end of 1919, Bolshevik Russian troops had reconquered four-fifths of Ukraine. The remaining western part was taken by Poland. Under Soviet rule, despite an initial period in the 20s, when they were allowed some cultural concessions, the Ukrainians suffered the largest catastrophe in their history since the Mongol invasion. During Stalin's collectivization drive in the early 30s, at least six million Ukrainians starved to death in the largest artificial famine ever known. Over the next few years, hundreds of thousands more were liquidated during the Great Purges. When the Second World War began, it was not surprising that there was so little love for Soviet rule amongst Ukrainians. Many of them hoped the war would provide the opportunity to restore Ukrainian independence. The Germans, however, treated Ukraine as a colony and its inhabitants as a subservient race. More than two million Ukrainians were taken away for forced labor. Meanwhile, the UPA, a Ukrainian underground army, arose. In action originally against the Germans, the UPA was to continue the fight for Ukrainian independence against the Russians until the end of the 1940s. At the end of the Second World War, there were some two million Ukrainians in Germany. After attempts to forcibly repatriate them had been abandoned, they were given up the opportunity of remaining in the West. Many of them went to North America. Some 40,000 Ukrainians stayed in this country. It's important to understand from the very start that Ukrainians regard themselves as political refugees who could not return home because of the prevailing oppressive conditions there. The hope in a brighter and better future for their homeland has conditioned the nature of community life in this country over the past 30 years. 
and coming to Britain, most of them were either in their teens or early 20s. They experienced a total culture shock. Coming from predominantly agricultural backgrounds, they had to make their way as alien members of Britain's industrial workforce. These conditions naturally encouraged them to draw together, and over the years, they managed to build up a well-organized and close-knit community. The Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain remains our largest and most important organization, though there is a smaller organization, the Federation of Ukrainians in Great Britain. Many other organizations were established to cater for the needs of particular sections of the community. For example, women's organizations, youth organizations, and many others. Ukrainian community life revolves around two main focal points, the community centers and the churches. There are over 50 such community centers distributed from Dundee to London, with a large concentration in Greater Manchester and West Yorkshire. As far as religion is concerned, most Ukrainians belong to either the Ukrainian Catholic Church or the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. In the 30 years, the Ukrainian community has managed to found a nursing home for the disabled, two old age pensioners' homes, two summer youth camps, one in North Wales, one in Derbyshire, a Ukraine cooperative, and several self-enterprising businesses. We have decided to take a look at the events which take place inside of a large Ukrainian community, in this case, Manchester's. With Walter Eaton Jones accompanying, Yaroslav Bobniak is conducting the girls' choir, Trimbita. Manchester holds many artifacts belonging to the Association of Ukrainian Women in Great Britain. This organization represents the Ukrainian women within the community, works with English women's organizations, and brings up Ukrainian children with a love for their country and its traditions. Nearly every community center has a Ukrainian Saturday school. Here the children are taught to read and write Ukrainian, as well as the basics of Ukrainian history, literature and geography. The male voice choir Homin, conducted by Yaroslav Babunyak, again accompanied by Walter Eaton Jones, has a long tradition of good quality singing. We see them here rehearsing the song Chovin Khitaycha for a Silver Jubilee concert. Most Ukrainians are churchgoers. Here we see the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Manchester. At the moment, the Ukrainian Catholics are in the middle of a dispute concerning the Vatican's reluctance to confer patriarchal status on the Ukrainian Catholic Church. Manchester also has a Ukrainian Orthodox Church. The Ukrainian Youth Association in Manchester has a mixed choir called Rusalka Dnistrova, which is conducted by Stefan Hunka. Besides the choir, the Ukrainian Youth Association holds regular meetings, organizes outings, and when necessary, political demonstrations. Ukrainian Scout Organization gives its young members not only the principles of world scouting, but also emphasizes the Ukrainian language, culture, and traditions.
The Orlik Dancing Group is one of the largest in this country. Some of its members are seen here performing the Hutul dance Kolomeika. The choreographers are Maria Babic and Dmitro Parayuk. Orlik has participated in many national and international festivals with considerable success. Ukrainians in Great Britain retain very strong emotional ties with their home country and they do everything they can to preserve their millennial culture, a culture whose origins reflect the Ukrainian nation's city and ancestors, the golden period of the Kievan state, when architecture, iconography and mosaicry were the products of the most developed medieval civilization in Eastern Europe. The 12th century epic poem about Prince Ihor's campaign against the Polovtsians is one of the first written works in a literature which bore, in the 19th century, Taras Shuchenko, and later, Franco and Ukrainka. A considerable contribution to world culture has been made by such Ukrainians as the 18th century composer Bortniansky, the writer and cinematographer Dozhenko, the sculptor Archipenko, Ukraine, especially in Kiev and Lviv, has a strong tradition of opera and ballet. The towns always fostered learning and the fine arts. The villages also played a great part in cultural development. It is in the villages, among the golden wheat fields of Ukraine, that the rich and varied folk arts arose. The Ukrainian village people's strong aesthetic sense cultivated throughout thousands of years, has made them transform the most utilitarian of objects into works of art. Another necessity of life which has been transformed into an art is cookery and baking. As on Christmas Eve, when each family, when the first star rises, places a lighted candle in their window to invite in any homeless strangers. They say a prayer and sit down to a meal consisting of 12 dishes to symbolize the 12 apostles. A folk art which has symbolic rather than utilitarian significance is the decoration of Easter eggs. Eggs, the symbol of fertility and new life, were already being decorated in Ukraine at least 3,000 years before Christ. They were offered as a gift to the sun god at the pagan festival of spring. Motifs used were the reindeer, the tree of life, the horse, the bird, the never-ending line, symbols of long life, happiness and prosperity. With the advent of Christianity, the fish, church and cross appeared in designs. As used to be done in the villages, Ukrainians in Great Britain decorate these eggs, the Sankhye, during Lent, and on Easter Sunday, take them to church to be blessed, together with the Easter basket containing a special bread, pasca, sausage, butter, cheese and horseradish. Music is a very important part of Ukrainian folk art. Ukrainians love singing, and they have a wide variety of folk songs. Even very small villages had their own folk choirs, and Ukrainians in Great Britain carry on this tradition. There are many choirs composed of both young and older Ukrainians who bring the sad and cheerful sounds of village life, the birds, the streams, the rustling trees, to Ukrainians in this country. Of the very 
various folk instruments played by Ukrainians in this country. Most popular is the bandura, the 56-stringed instrument first used in the 17th century by the Cossack Kobzars, the minstrels who used to wander from village to village telling of the nation's heroic past. Another form of folk art, which is carefully preserved and developed, almost exclusively among the young, is dancing. There are many groups, large and small, all over Britain. It is the desire of most young Ukrainians to possess their own national costume, an outward symbol of their belonging to the Ukrainian community. This may be, as on the right, the popular costume from Kiev, or, in the center, the dress from Poltava, and the girl on the left is wearing the beautifully embroidered Hutzel costume, reflecting the greens, oranges and yellows of the Carpathian Mountains. And here you see two others. On the right, the dark, elegant costume of Ternopil in Western Ukraine, with the sleeves heavily embroidered. And finally, the cheerful dress from Yavoriu in the Lviv region. Young Ukrainians born in Great Britain have a strong wish to preserve their culture and practice the folk arts whenever they can. Also, using traditional frameworks, they create new forms of Ukrainian art, music and dress. In present-day Ukraine, however, the Soviet authorities use both subtle and brutal means to suppress the culture. Not only is Russification a government policy, historical and cultural monuments and especially churches, are physically destroyed, as described by imprisoned poet Ihor Kalinets. The eternal rafters were creaking. The beams were flying like feathers. They were ruining a wooden miracle of human labor and faith. And engraved on the gentle mountains, the domes were swaying their last. They died undaunted and proud, as die the last of a race and the icons sought final shelter among the surrounding weeds, and a Hutzel Madonna was weeping in her shattered frame. Ukrainians in this country have frequently displayed their concern and indignation about what is happening in Ukraine, sometimes in the form of protests, like the one when the former Soviet secret police chief, Alexander Shalepin, came to Britain in 1975. They are deeply concerned, not only by the flagrant and widespread violation of human and national rights in Ukraine, but also by the Soviet policy of Russification, that is, the denationalization of the non-Russian nations of the USSR, and their assimilation into the dominant Russian culture. Following the death of Stalin, a brief period of relaxation in the nationality sphere made possible a remarkable revival in the cultural and public life of Ukraine. It was spearheaded by the courageous generation of the 60s, composed mainly of young literary intellectuals, who boldly opposed Khrushchev's decision to step up once again the policy of Russification. A wave of arrests in 1965 not only failed to silence dissenters in Ukraine, but actually precipitated the emergence of a Ukrainian human and national rights movement. In 1970, the young Ukrainian historian Valentin Moroz received a draconian 14-year sentence for his powerful protest writings. At the beginning of 1972, the KGB launched a massive crackdown in Ukraine, which was designed to crush the growing national assertiveness of the Ukrainians. Purges affected every sector of Ukrainian life, and even Petro Shelis, the party boss in Ukraine, was removed from his post. Hundreds of persons, mainly young writers, artists and scholars, were sentenced to inhumanly severe terms of imprisonment. The most talented and courageous representatives of an entire generation are now in labor camps, prisons and psychiatric hospitals. We asked Peter Redaway, an authority on Soviet affairs, about the importance of the Ukrainian problem. I think 
of all the many different forms of dissent in the Soviet Union that have developed in the last 15 years or so, the national minority dissent is what worries the authorities more than anything else. The strongest movements have been in the Ukraine and Lithuania, with important but less powerful movements in Latvia, Estonia, Georgia, Armenia, and a few others. The seriousness of the Ukrainian problem relates, I think, to the fact that the Ukraine is economically so important to the Soviet Union, and that if a strong national movement was able to express itself, secessionist tendencies might develop, and the Ukraine might eventually secede from the Union. So the KGB has cracked down very, very hard in the mid-60s and again in 1972, suppressing virtually all forms of national Ukrainian dissent. And I think they put it at the very top of their priorities in dealing with discontent and dissent. Today, conditions in Ukraine remain extremely oppressive. The most recent example concerns the 1975 Helsinki Agreement, which included provisions about human rights. As in other parts of the Soviet Union, a group to monitor the Soviet government's observance of this international agreement was set up in Ukraine at the beginning of 1977. Though the Soviet government is a signatory of the Helsinki Final Act, it has responded by imprisoning at least six members of this small group. In June 1977, the Ukrainian Helsinki Group's chairman, the well-known writer Mykola Rudenko, received a sentence of 12 years. His colleague, the teacher, Alexa Tichy, was sentenced to a staggering total of 15 years. A couple of weeks ago, another two members of this group were both given 12-year sentences. Very recently, a, a wider movement in defense of workers' rights in the USSR has emerged, headed by Volodymyr Khlebanov and other Ukrainians. The Soviet attitude towards the Ukrainian problem can be seen in this tonight interview of last year with one of the editors of Pravda. There are all kinds of things happening in the Soviet Union which simply do not appear in Pravda. For instance, at the moment, there are two members of the Ukrainian Helsinki Committee who are being tried on charges of anti-Soviet activity. Why is this trial not reported in the Soviet press? <laughs> Fine. If that's what you're interested in, it's your affair. But as far as the legal activities of the entire Soviet Union are concerned, well, of course, we can't report every single case or every trial. It's natural. Just as the English press probably doesn't print accounts of every single action by the British legal authorities or organs, but if you're talking about people that the Western, the bourgeois press makes out to be martyrs, well, those people, we've got a word for them here, malcontents. They represent no one and their activities don't interest our readers either. But if, for instance, there were a group of people who were arguing the case for, say, a, a separatist movement in the Ukraine, where could, in which newspaper in the Soviet Union could they express their views? We don't have any such group. If there were such a group. And if the Martians landed in England? And if Triffids marched on London, what then? Behind the facade of a federal structure, the USSR remains a vast Russian empire. The constitutional rights of the non-Russian republics exist only on paper. All important decisions are made in Moscow. Even though Soviet Ukraine has its own seat at the United Nations, foreign diplomats and journalists are not allowed to work in this republic. Any complaints about the denial of basic civil liberties, russification and national discrimination are answered with repression. The Soviet authorities have not only made Russification state policy at home, they also skillfully encourage the erroneous belief abroad that Russia and the Soviet Union are one and the same thing. Unfortunately, they are aided in this by frequent slack reporting, outright carelessness or ignorance, as in this example concerning the Ukrainian sprinter Borzov, which has resulted in the virtual acceptance by the British press and television as conventional practice that for the Soviet Union or USSR read Russia. By doing so, the British media effectively denies the existence of the non-Russian nations 
that make up the USSR, Ukrainians, Lithuanians, Georgians, Uzbeks, Armenians, and many, many others. We would like to finish the program with a plea that was made in a recent letter to the Times by a courageous and honest Russian, Vladimir Bukovsky, who himself spent 12 years in Soviet prisons for his human rights activity. Bukovsky concluded his letter with the following words. Considering that many of those currently imprisoned in the USSR were persecuted for defending their national cultures and languages, the least that can be done in the West is to ensure that the difference between Russia proper and the Soviet Union is understood and that the two terms are not used interchangeably. What's your name? Botanka Sklarenko. What? Botanka Sklarenko. What kind of a name is that? It's Ukrainian. What? It's Ukrainian.